Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We're, I think, uh, the last thing before our drinks reception book panel. So, um, but thank you for staying till the end. Um, and thank you very much to uh, one of the panel members, Julie Bode, um, uh, my colleague at City University, who suggested that we um, end with a, a, a panel discussion about um, open educational practices, a topic very close to my heart. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted um, to be chairing this session. Um, and uh, I'm going to let my um, panel members each introduce themselves um, in a moment. We've got a couple of slides to show you um, uh, to talk a bit about um, how we support open educational practices um, in the various institutions that we work in. Um, but we're also hoping to have a discussion with you as well. So um, I will just briefly introduce myself. I think some of you might have been in the session. I was uh, leading earlier. I'm Jane Secker, Senior Lecturer in Educational Development at City University. And one of the modules I teach um, at City in our postgraduate certificate um, is uh, uh, on open educational practices. It's called digital literacies and open um, and open practice. And um, so uh, this is a play, the subject very close to my heart. Um, and I will let our panel members introduce themselves. So in no particular order. Oh, okay. uh, my name is Leo Hammond, and uh, I work at the University of and also the PhD. Okay, I'm Jane Slater. I work at the University of Edinburgh. I'm a principal for our online and open American My name is Chris Morris, and I'm a copyright and licensing specialist at the Bodleian Library at the University of Oxford. I provide support and guidance at the policy around copyright and licensing, which is a very important part of it. I am Julie Gross, I'm from the University of London. I'm a heritage of education and also a part time senior lecturer at RTG today on the module on the Okay, great, thank you. So I think what we're going to start by doing is, I think we're going to go to some polls. Um, I don't know if somebody's there to assist me. So we've used the term open educational practices. Um, and I think we're just going to be launching a poll um, to find out before we start to tell you more about this, how familiar are you um, with the term open educational practices? Okay, it looks like somewhat familiar um, is the one that's coming up mainly. Um, I can go to our definition of open educational practices at this point, um, if that's helpful. So um, there are a variety of definitions, but this is the, the um, definition that I find quite useful. It's about practices which support the reuse and production of OER, which are open educational resources, through institutional policies, um, promote innovative pedagogic models, um, and respect and empower learners as co-producers on their lifelong learning path. Um, another definition also, or a kind of way of describing open educational practices. So one of the key people who writes a lot in this field, Catherine Cronin, she um, joined us at a panel discussion we held at the OER conference last year. Um, says that um, open educational practices are complex, they're personal, they're contextual, and they're continually negotiated. And I think some of those themes are going to come up when our panel members speak a bit about their own practices. Um, we've got a couple more um, polls. So could I have the next poll, please? I think just, just to find out a bit more about your understanding of open educational practices. So I think this is this is this, this is a free text comment, is it Julie? Yeah. So what does open educational practice mean to you? Then? And you can put some examples of what you think it might be. That'd be interesting to hear. We're going to write this up as well. So this is a useful way. We're going to get the data from these polls um, and, and summarize that after today. Free courses. Free. <laughs> open is free. Sharing, MOOCs, I can see up there, yeah. 
free and sharing are uh, coming up. Caring. Caring. Caring, well, caring, sharing is caring. I think it's probably separating out all the words you write unless you put them in inverted commas and phrase. So, okay, we've got to be accessible there. I can see the word access, yeah, resources. Looks like free sharing access resources. Yay! <laughs> that would sound good. Right, shall we go on to the next, go on to the next slide? You can carry on with that one if you want, but. We will be here until tea time. Okay, so we're interested in um, whether you have um, a policy at your institution um, that supports open educational practice. That's interesting. We're going to talk a bit about, I think some of the panel members are going to talk a bit about policy. Anyone on the panel want to comment on what's coming up? <laughs> Quite a lot of people not sure. I think there's a lot in there that we could pick up on. I think yeah. we're not sure that's quite integral to what we're doing. Definitely, definitely. Okay. And can I have my last slide, please? Or my last poll, sorry. So this question is around whether um, open educational practices are embedded in any of your staff development offer that you have in your institution at all. So I talked about the module that I run as part of our PGC HG at City. Um, do you have something similar? Do you run any workshops? Okay, that is interesting, isn't it? Again, we've got lots of people not sure. Quite a lot of no's, very few yeses. Yes. Yes, lots of things. Okay, panel. Right. So, shall we shall we get going? I think that's it with our um, polls. Thanks very much for that. Um, okay. So um, that was our questions. We're going to talk um, each of us in turn about some examples um, from our practice, um, and um, each of the panel have just got a brief slide to illustrate what they're talking about. Um, and as I say, then we'll have time. We've got quite, I've got questions for our panel, which we'll come back to at the end, and we'll take questions from the floor. Um, so, but I think I'm going to just start us off. So, um, I mentioned that uh, we have a module as part of our. Well, it's actually, we go through to master's level in academic practice at City, and I created the module um, digital literacies and open practice in 2018. So I've actually been running this module now for five years um, at the D15 credit module. Um, it explores, I would say, two quite meaty topics in their own right. So we look at digital literacies um, of staff and of students, um, and we look at the concept of digital scholarship. And the module is very influenced by people such as Martin Weller. Um, he sees um, openness as a kind of key part of digital scholarship. So in conjunction with talking about digital literacies, we talk about open educational practices, which means we talk in, about open access to research and scholarly um, outputs. We talk about OERs, so open educational resources. We talk about creative commons. Uh, we talk about um, how those sort of licenses work. And uh, Julie's been teaching on this module for the last couple of years with me. Um, we've got a, obviously lots of resources are all in Moodle, but the spirit of this course in being open, it also has a course blog. So if you want to have a look at some of the things that go on in the module, um, you can do that. And I've always had a webinar series, which is an open series, so that people could join the, the webinars from my guest speakers and uh, participate in that module. Now, this year, for the first time, one of the things I was really struck by in previous years and talking to Julie was that some people would choose to do their assignment on digital literacies. I would say more of them would choose to do it on digital literacies. Um, some would write about open, open access often. Um, but they weren't actually having to practically engage with what it meant to be open in their work. And so we changed the course 
um, last year, we made some amendments to the module to say that the final assignment that they do, which is a written piece of work, has to be shared openly. Um, many people chose to share that on the course blog. And over the last couple of weeks, um, now all the markings finished and all those um, essays are, are they're, they're all out there. Um, I've been I've been publishing them, um, the student writing on the blog. So there's a whole series of student posts. Um, and it's really, really exciting to read those. What one of the things that will strike you if you have a look at the blog is that lots of them are actually health practitioners. So at City, we have a lot of nursing um, lecturers, but we have a lot of other allied health professionals and Many of them have chosen to write about the impact that open has um, on um, health practice and the kind of I, I think the kind of bigger philosophical issues about why um, sharing resources and finding and using open educational resources or open access materials is so transformational to them. And it is really transformational. I have to say that many of the staff who come on this course um, go away saying this just has completely changed my view of, of you know how 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 scholarly communication works how I should be sharing my materials and they've actually put creative commons on the licenses on their essays as well so it's really really exciting for me to see that um, and do have a look um, because I think it for me that's a, a fantastic um, example of open actually in practice so that's my example, and I think I'm handing over to Julie next. Yeah. Uh, yes. So then just um, I'm from digital education, and the world of online is beautiful. Um, it is a work. We've always published our materials online, freely so available. But I think um, one thing about being open is being exclusive. People are making them open, so what we want to do is to help you open it. And the other thing that we did during the pandemic that we found was something we really need to do more, which was raising awareness of the open education school. So we ran a workshop um, for staff, and it's something that we do in the past that we want to change. Uh, and again, it's that transformation. A lot of staff aren't aware that they need to talk about them and they can see. And so it's raising awareness of the workshop. I think one of the challenges we've got, I'll probably talk a bit more later, is about the reach of the model and the workshop that we run. And how can we reach more staff with this? And maybe that ties into the written of the and it's just worth highlighting as well, isn't it, Julie, that the um, resource, the, the workshop that we use drew heavily on openly licensed educational resources from the University of Edinburgh. So we we um, were able to adapt those in our session. Okay, I think next up we've got Melissa. Melissa Hyden. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so at Edinburgh, um, so from that definition about promoting, promoting it's Institutional uh, production of are we on? Yeah, yeah, but so um, I focus on it at institutional level at industrial scale. So what I am trying to do is to shift huge volumes of born digital, locally created learning resources out onto the web with Creative Commons license on them so that they can be used by anybody else who wants to. And in the way that I do that is at different level. So as well as we do have an institutional policy on open educational resources, and it's at institutional level, but I don't necessarily think the policy has to be at institutional level. And in fact, I think that the University of Edinburgh will try not to have it in any institutional level policy. It's worth it to have your policy at the correct enabling level. You need it where the activity is happening. So we have a policy. So we have a support service and we have recurrent resources of dismissing against that district staff support service. And we build options or, or we build nudges, we build the simplest, the easiest option into all, all of the platforms and systems to choose for the colleagues who create the materials to most easily choose. Lower the barrier as much as we can to making the choice to put the Creative Commons license on 
material as a result of that is that we have hundreds of thousands of species of pollen all over the world. And, and those are used by people in lots of different ways. It's a considerable business, it's a good return on investment for us in terms of global reach and the institutional mission, uh, particularly around the UAS DGs. So um, it's, I suppose, about taking a slightly different approach that's not an individual person as much as institutional person. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. We'll pick up on some of that, I'm sure. Okay, I think next up we have uh, my slide. So, it's Chris, yeah, yeah. Hello, it's me. I should start speaking anyway. So, yeah. like that, I, up until last year, I was working at the University of Kent, uh, where I was also a compliment to my teaching practice. But during that time as well, uh, I was working with Jane um, on copyright literacy. Uh, we ran the website copyright.org and created a number of open education resources to teach people about copyright law, copyright card game, functions about exactly the board game, about how the communication is used on the city. Um, what your third day and Julie have just spoken about. But during my time at Kent, I was looking at how do I develop what I'm doing? How do I provide support around copyrights? So that addresses what we need to be doing as an institution and thinking about it at the broader level. Because often when you're talking to people about copyright, unless you're talking about trying to make things simple and straightforward, make it easy, copyright can sometimes make everything seem very, very complicated and difficult. And not at all and easy. Uh, and part of what came about from the work Jay and I have been doing is realizing thinking about copyright, explaining it, communicating it, talking about it, it helps you to think about it from a literacy perspective. Don't think about it as a road set of rules, you can get right or wrong. These are things, ongoing conversations that we've talked about all the time. And that underpins conversations about open education practice. This is very much about, well, I've made this. What are my rights in it? How can I benefit from it? What bits should I keep? What bits should I give away? Um, yeah, and these are valid concerns. But in order to try to move that conversation forward, um, I worked with colleagues to develop a copyright literacy strategy at the University of Kent, which wasn't an open education strategy or an open education policy, but it certainly had that thread running through it. In fact, some of the statements in there about questioning assumptions about copyright, about balancing, the private ownership of information goods versus public sharing good are, are in there. So I think I took that as far as I could, given that, that institution that time, it wasn't a, a sort of high level adoption of open education. I kept saying, look at what Edinburgh are doing, it's brilliant, we should do what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my attempt to kind of get that space in the open institution. So last year I moved to holiday libraries at the University of Oxford. Which is a fantastic opportunity. I work in the Open Scholarship Support Team. I have a scholarship that spends a lot of what we do is a lot of support around open access publishing. To be honest, that's the main area that we traditionally focus on. But increasingly bringing things into that, like research data management, you know, that's your favorite topic, Jane. Um, copyright is in there. And I can say, open education, what about open education? And, and clearly at the university, I can say there's been a lot of work. In fact, Melissa, uh, instrumental. Your time in putting things in place, such as our fantastic range of podcasts and other educational resources, and maps to like open courseware, great stuff. Uh, but it seems like a really good time to be there now because we have a physical education strategy and it's said very specifically for open education resources and practice and also copyright. So I've written in there. So the final thing I think would be good to pick up on in the general discussion is about how. Moving from institutions, different institutional experiences can help to inform a sector wide uh, understanding of what open education practice is and what could be based on a, a developing context. Okay, thank you, Chris. Okay, slides working again. So, so Leo now. Let's see. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my um, doctoral research in this area, the danger of to allow a PhD student to uh, <laughs> my panel, my panel level members of the 
done for me in this. So I will take the um, take the opportunity. So uh, really, I just I talk a bit about how I've been thinking about the topic of institutional policy for open education because um, in the kind of history of the open education movement, there has been quite a lot of um, work done, a lot of um, at the especially at the international level, especially by organisations like UNESCO, UNESCO in particular, to call for more policy engagement around around this topic. And mostly their audience that they are kind of speaking to are um, kind of member states. Um, and, um, and so a lot of the thinking is around how does policy kind of unlock um, resources to enable practice to happen. Um, but I actually think it's really, really vital that we are also thinking um, at the institutional level where the people who are, um, who are doing these practices, who are, who are living these practices day to day are actually based um, and, um, and able to um, effect change sometimes with really, I think, quite small um, interventions, quite, quite, quite small forms of support that um, actually enable um, quite, quite a big change. Uh, so in terms of um, in terms of practices, I think it's important that we think about um, what I've got down the right hand side about open educational practices as being quite a wide range of, of different kinds of things. So sometimes we think, oh yeah, I do that, or I know people who do that, and it's kind of a, um, a thing that my institution does. So we don't necessarily always think about as being open education, but um, but all of these things can um, in one way or another be be linked into this idea of, of openness. But of course, to talk about opening um, can, can be in, in various different ways. Um, in the case of resources, we might be thinking particularly about the licensing of resources that enable them to be, um, to be freely accessed and, and redistributed and also um, changed and uh, you know, reused in a, in a new form by other people. Um, but there are also open universities, which are about enabling access and participation in, in higher education. Um, and then we've also got um, what's sometimes called open pedagogy, which is where you're um, working with students so that they can develop knowledge and disseminate their, their knowledge um, and, and you know, produce and share um, their own ideas and, and resources. Um, and we also have a whole lot of ways of networking and crowdsourcing knowledge production um, amongst um, open community practice. So I think all of these practices are actually important and they all complement each other. Um, and enable if you if you want to achieve greater openness as an institution, if you want to produce um, open educational resources or gain more adoption of existing ones, um, which is something that we've been talking about a lot with our external universities, as well as starting to produce some open textbooks. We're also trying to encourage people to look at the open textbook studies so they can think about adoption um, for their own courses, for example. Um, then, then actually, the more that people have a sense of how they can participate in a range of different practices, then the more I think, you know, that these things actually are kind of mutually supported. Um, in, in terms of thinking about what, what to my, I mean by policy or what could policy mean, um, I think also it pays to take an expansive view, but not necessarily about saying an institution has to adopt, or if we're only thinking about institutions that adopt an OER and 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 policy, for example, a lot of them policy work that goes on specifically focuses more on that than on any of the other areas. Um, and, and seems to sort of suggest that maybe what you want to do is create standalone or the art policy. But I think um, you might have a dedicated policy for that. You might have policy which affects it, for example, your institutional um, intellectual property um, guidance or kind of copyright rules around who owns the copyright and the resource, resources that they produce, which um, many people is that they just can't actually answer the question whether they own it with the institution. Um, and, um, but, but policy can even also be a wider thing. It can be about the strategy and guidance and support information that you provide. It can be the normal courses of action and the way that people do things um, in the sense that you can say, well, it's not a policy to do this, or it is. Um, it, um, it can be in the fact that you resource certain projects or initiatives. It can be about um, having people and, and know how and place to support us to do things. Um, and it can be about the infrastructure that as, as an institution you, you provide in order to enable certain kinds of things to be done. And um, so really I, I just wanted to say that um, I think that one of the key ways that we can enable and support open education practices 
if you're looking at policy, but we need to think about it in quite a um, holistic way. Um, you know, quite expansive view of, of both policy. And, and... Okay, thank you, panel members. So um, we've got a few questions for you to consider. You may have questions coming from the floor as well. So if you could start getting your thinking caps on if anyone wants to ask a question of our panel members. Otherwise, I will kick it off with um, the first question on here, and I don't know if there is a particular panel member who wants to wave at me to so able to answer this, but how open is your online and distance learning and how open can it be? Anybody want to go with that question? Jane, I was just thinking as we were talking about our module, I mean, our module is available for other people to pay to send us to the individual study by um, but the thing associated with today is because it's part of the master's program, um, although there is a discount for the university monitor, but there's still a fee associated with it. So, you know, our, in our own module, this is really entirely open as it could be. No, I think it's about 500 pounds to go on it. Yeah. So, we, we actually did have this conversation of how much we could give away and how much. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone else want to speak about that question? On how open online distance learning would be, Alyssa? Okay, we have um, well, two different, two very interesting flavors online. Online distance learning master's courses, just in November, 18 or so, those are like closed, those expensive. Um, and then we also have our nine three think MOOCs, and hundreds of here. And those are open and free. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose for me, the, the important thing is that all of the materials that make up both the online masters and the moves have licenses that allow them, allow the institution to move those materials around, to remake them, to reuse them, to reshape them. And adapt them. And actually, that's one of the biggest returns on investment to the institution is that we reuse our own material. And if material has been made when it's made, so as the older it gets, the further it gets from the person who made it originally, the more the information about when they made it and what they use it, where they got all those bits from, and who. You own that image gets separated and lost. And so when you do come to want to move it to the platform or put it on differently or to be cast it in some way, that information is lost. So the time that you spend at the beginning licensing all the elements to know it what the license on the package or piece is means that it will save you time in the future when you need to move it around. And so so the stitch in time saves nine, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Go back to all the no no library copyright clearance of like to go back to somebody's old legacy learning experience mm -hmm. trying to hang on. But an example of how that again how that was benefited us was during the pandemic. We had a we have a master's in public health, um, which is um, it's it's the uh, healthcare, and that was the master's course. But during the pandemic, we took a chunk of that and the spirit of it. So, the future part turned around and that will be committed to the frontline work. 50,000 people took that within the first couple of weeks. And um, that was credit again to the team, the academic team who owned the material that knew about it. Like, the fact that we were able to make sure that we very quickly put it onto an open platform. And also, um, thank you to the future learn team who fed um, up a whole bunch of their quality assurance. <laughs> we used. Anybody else want to speak on that first? Or, or another question? I now can't see the slides because you may be sending the panel. So, yeah. So, shall so we? Yeah, so shall we do the next question? Yeah, I don't know what's coming in the chat. I don't know, are we getting any questions coming in on the chat? I've got some questions on the poll, but yeah, on the poll. Okay, so I think we've got some people asking about. 
how to find you. I think I saw one that disappeared off the screen about how to find OER, wasn't it? Yeah. Finding and reuse of subject specific OER properly understood. I think I would agree with that. There was a comment about will AI help people to find relevant OER. I think that's a really interesting question. Yeah. And there, there are people who are working on working on that, um, on the kind of the combination of AI and open education at the moment. Uh, and, and and they definitely believe that, that that will be a great option. Uh, obviously, when you when you think about current um popular popular AI things that are available. Um, they may may call themselves open. Um, they uh, are trained on um, on kind of past um, data. They don't necessarily have access to the the internet to find information that's kind of currently uh, appearing. Um, but I think as time goes on, AI will become better at kind of servicing um, current and new material. So just for some turn, I think there's a comment there about not just about finding OER, but also getting the, the relevant support. Um, yeah, in short, got to provide the training and um, OER themselves. And I think it links in with I mean the other point you're making about policy, seeing that in the sort of the broader, more expansive sense. So the conversations I've been having since I've joined Oxford about how, what can we do to support open education, and I think it would be helpful to have a clear open education policy that was unequivocal and it was there. Uh, but I'm also hearing, in terms of the culture of the organisation, and I'm talking about how that we create a policy or a strategy on this, and what colleagues are saying to me is, well, by the time you try to write a policy and get it through any number of committees, you probably spend your time pushing quarter up hill. And if you've just written a whole load of guidance that said, this is how you do the X, Y, and Z. You've effectively created a policy by you know, creating that guidance. And I think some, the, the way I'm seeing Oxford's journey towards open education practice is that just coalescing on a point where we can explain to people what it is, what we're talking about, how we've been doing it for years, how we invented it, because I think that's a, 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 an approach we like to take. Um, and, and then just that kind of coalesces into a combination of policy and practice, um, not without clear leadership, and I'm pleased that we do have open education in our in our digital education strategy. But I think I think that's a key part of it, is that the support needs to be knitted into that process of developing what, what the policy and strategy is. So we we we've got a question up on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I see you've got a question there. How do we counter institutional reluctance? Forecast releasing material under own licenses, worried over ability to track reuse, not being able to include the actual figures in reports, impact cases. I don't know if anyone would like to comment on that. One of the things, I mean, we don't have a policy that is it, it's kind of silent on open. Um, and it, for the first year, I thought the module actually somebody on the course, an academic, said, Do I am I allowed to share my teaching materials? Um, what what the you know the internet policy problem today, and it does say that city owns teaching materials. So we have had an instance of a couple of people actually asking permission so they can do it. Um, all my teaching materials got created from the on. I say, oh, forgiveness, not permission. So <laughs> uh, yeah, what do you contribute to that? I think I think asking forgiveness, not permission, is a very good. At the kind of individual level, when you're in that context where it um, isn't it, that clear whether you're allowed to or whether, or well, not, not just whether you're allowed to, but whether anyone cares. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but I do think that this is one of the uses of, of policies. Like, I do think that, that, that um, I, I take everyone's point that actually our institutions have a lot of policies that people don't necessarily pay that much attention to. But I think that it should be possible to find, find out. Whether it whether the institution endorses um, releasing your um, teaching resources um, openly, and and ideally, what we'll possibly goes a bit further than that, that is how you contact the board that helps you to do it, yeah. um, and actually put some kind of resources in place in terms of human. Yeah.
the university politics, whether you have, if you are allowed to. So yes, the universities do generally politics, but do generally own have the copyright of the things that you create as part of your work. That doesn't mean that the institution doesn't find that you legal. The institution may be fine with you legal. The institution will be trying to figure out what the risk of you doing this. The policy will be to protect the institution against that risk. And if there doesn't seem to be any great risk in you doing that, then the institution is likely to say, yeah, so if you think about the kinds of things that might be a risk, then, I mean, there are whole swathes of our teaching materials that are born digital and locally made that don't hold any particular research copyrights, probably weren't going to be converted into very expensive lucrative um, products for the institution, and the institution would rather um, that they could work as outreach and public good. But then, how risky your materials would be. Yeah, it might be overestimating. Yeah, just thinking about that point we had the case where we worked with an academic on a video and they moved to another institution and wanted to take it there. And the perspective was, well, is this going to impact on the number of students who come to our institution or the new institution? And I'm like, what a video. Mm -hmm. Probably it might come quite well mean that might be made it, but you know, what, yeah, what is the impact of that? The other thing, um, when I worked at the previous institution, there was a plenary, disciplinary difference between two of the, the departments of faculty um, who were very much about, well, I just put my teaching as through online. It wasn't this really openly licensed, but they just naturally put it online and shared the material. Whereas the other two were very much about, what kind of money spend this? What can I get out of it? For all this hard work. So I wonder if there are some disciplinary differences that may impact that. Yeah. Um. I think our time is up actually, so but we can continue this discussion hopefully a bit people are staying around and want to chat with us further. I know there's more comments coming in on the poll, so the questions, some interesting questions we have had time to address. But, um I still was handing away the book launch. Um, maybe a glass of wine, is it? <laughs> okay, well thank you very much to my panel. Thanks for um, you know, inviting us. Thank you.